Uh, we have a question from a student at the beginning here asking me to clarify what I meant by a fixed action pattern. Do you remember what a fixed action pattern was? We were talking about behavior. We said it was an instinctive movement. Basically, it's an ethological term of, of from zoology, the, the ethologists in the field of zoology originated this study of inherited behavior patterns. Okay, humans have many of them, and all animals. Their behavior patterns there are pretty similar from one member of the species to the other because the basic pattern is inherited. Brain structures develop under genetic control and form the circuits necessary for these patterns. It would include in humans things like crying and smiling and frowning and uh, looking down when you're a little shy and things like that. There have been cross-cultural studies of human. There's a very nice book on human ethology by Ibel Ibisfeldt if any of you are interested. And there's also a very well-known book by Darwin, Charles Darwin. Um, and it, he pictures a number of these behavior patterns, like in dogs. All right. We have a little more to say about these primitive cellular mechanisms. Uh, we've been talking about secretion. This is from the last class. Now you should know from the quiz, <laughs> if you didn't remember, since I stated it in the question, how were these things discovered? It, they were all discovered by electron microscopy. Uh, and I drew pictures of them. We've talked about all seven of these. Okay. What is exocytosis? It's just a term for a secretion by a cell. The cell puts something out. What is endocytosis? Is cell drinking, the cell drinks something in. Both of these things happen at one place more than any other in neurons, and that's at the terminal, the axon terminal. Okay. Exocytosis, that's how it secretes neurotransmitters when the vesicles join to the membrane and so forth. How do we know? Endocytosis takes place. Yes. Okay, the auto the reuptake mechanisms involving autoreceptors can take up neurotransmitter. How could we test it experimentally? It doesn't only take up neurotransmitter. We can inject some substance, uh, some protein, some enzyme. It might be fluorescent, might be a fluorescent dye. We can inject it and uh, some tracer substance that's taken up by the cell and then we'll, if it gets taken up by the cell and moves within the cell, we'll be able to see it. So we do that with things like horseradish peroxidase. I'll show you pictures of that later today. It's taken up by the cell terminals. It's also taken up by the cell body. But if you put it in a region of termination, say we put it in the in the optic tectum where the retina terminates, or in the lateral geniculate body, any place the retina terminates. If we put a substance, a tracer substance, it'll be taken up by the terminals, and then it gets transported. How does it do that? Well, there are active transport mechanisms, remember? It's moved back to all the way to the cell body, and so we can look later. We give it a little time to happen. It'll show up in the cell body. Okay. <laughs>
Remember what the molecules are involved in retrograde and anterograde transport? There's two of them I mentioned, kinesin and dynein. Dynein is the one involved in retrograde transport, the process I just described. Okay. Uh, these processes can move not just molecules, but they can move organelles. So organelles get transported from the cell body down to the terminal. Uh, little vesicles containing various things. Okay. And usually when we get retrograde transport also, the substance is encapsulated in a little vesicle and an organelle, and that's what actually moves back to the cell body. Okay, so I'm going to now talk about how these cellular dynamics are used in experimental studies, the CNS, mostly anatomical studies, where this process of sectioning the brain is used so that we can look at it with a microscope. Now, in order to section the brain, you've got to fix the brain. Okay. In order to see anything in it, you've got to put, do something to the tissue because the brain by itself, you're not going to see too much. You can see things uh, if the brain has been fixed because myelin, for example, will uh, bend the light differently from the non-myelinated areas and so you can, you can make out air myelinated fiber bundles. But you won't see the cells well unless you stain them. So we have various ways of staining them, or we can inject things in them. We'll talk mainly about things we inject in them today so that we can trace accents. But first of all, we have to fix the brain, which means we usually do that in the process of killing an experimental animal. It replaces blood with a fixative. Okay, it's an embalming procedure. Uh, what are the fixatives? first used were things like alcohol, okay, and certain acids, uh, but the, the fixatives that have made the biggest difference for neuroanatomical work are the aldehydes, formaldehyde initially, and then for electron microscopy and other things as well, glutaraldehyde. So after the brain is fixed, it will harden to some degree depending on the fixative and then it can be sectioned. In order to section it, we have to, we can freeze it and cut frozen sections. That doesn't allow us to cut very thin sections. We can cut down to maybe 15 or 20 micron thick sections if we freeze the brain. There's a couple different ways of doing that. You can freeze it with powder dry ice on a sliding microtome, or we can freeze it in a cryostat where the whole blade and brain and everything is kept at a low temperature. But there are other ways still, without causing any freezing. We can embed the brain in something. We can embed it in wax, for example, paraffin embedding. Um, and there's other things like celloidin that we can embed in our nitrocellulose. But let's say now that we've injected something My computer is, it must be asking me something. If that's mine, I don't know, maybe it's one of the others nearby computers here. Okay. Now we mentioned the Golgi stain before. This is a picture of a section that's a little thinner than is usually done for Golgi stain. The process was that a block of tissue was prepared. The brain is blocked into very thick sections and stained with the silver procedures that will mark certain cells. And that's how these black cells were produced with the Golgi method. Uh, this is a particular Golgi method that was modified by Cox. So the Golgi-Cox method in order to get a lot of cells and their dendrites. And then after the brain, after that was done, then the brain was cut into thinner sections, and it was counterstained for cells. It didn't work too well, but you can sort of see some cells there in the background. It just points out that you're staining only 
a small percentage of cells. And you can see the cell bodies and the dendrites. You can see the pyramidal cells with the apical dendrite. You can see a little non-pyramidal shaped cell there, a granule cell. You can make out dendrites in this particular stain. We can sometimes see the axon, like there. We can see the axon beginning. Other times, it's a little more difficult. There's an axon beginning. Okay. And Cajal was the anatomist that used this the most, so it's been used by a number of other people. He was particularly prolific, perhaps because of an ability he had that he didn't actually have to trace the axons the way most people will do now. And it's rather difficult and tedious to trace in detail these axons. Well, if he didn't trace them, how did he do it? Does anybody know? He had a photographic memory very unusual sort. He would study the brain for a long period of time. He would see huge numbers of cells, but studying them, he would pay attention to what he most wanted to learn that day, and then he'd go for a walk. And then he'd come back and realize what he really wanted to draw, and he would draw them with remarkable accuracy. <laughs> when people redo the things he studied, they pretty much find the same things. And that's what he's doing here. He's not looking through the microscope. He's just drawing. OK, now, one of the methods, the, the first method that was widely used for experimental tracing of a pathway was the degeneration technique. And there's more than one of them. Now, when I say experimental tracing of a pathway, that's to be contrasted with looking at material where nothing's been done to the brain, but looking at a, a normal brain that's then been fixed and stained, say, for axons. There are stains that will stain axons. And you can, you can see major fiber bundles and so forth. But you can't, there's so many axons, you can't really find, discover for sure where they're going. Okay, or even where they came from. In some cases, like axons coming out of the eye, it's pretty obvious they came where they came from. They came from someplace in the retina. Okay, but when those axons reach terminal areas in the brain, you can follow the track to the main terminal areas. But it's even there, it's difficult to see all the places they terminate without some experimental tracing method. And those are what we call the track tracing methods. Okay. The initial method was developed by Markey. It was for staining degenerating myelin. Okay. The Markey method. Sorry, that's a CHI there. There was a problem with the marking method. It could it could mark a, a degenerating myelin. Okay, that's what it was good for. Degenerating myelinated pathways could be specifically marked. But it had a major problem in that the myelin usually disappears in the terminal region. So the myelin doesn't go all the way to the terminal boutons. So you could never be absolutely sure. I mean, if you were skillful and you had also done Golgi studies and studied Cajal and so forth, Many people that use the Markey method turned out to be right. Degeneration methods have other. This is using the technique of anterograde generation, which I should explain here first. What you see in the picture here is a. This is the yellow cell there is connected by an axon to another cell. It all has, has input in the cell over here, and it shows the site of injury. Okay, now if that's injury transects the axon, 
okay? You will get degeneration then in two directions. Anterograde degeneration will be the degeneration of the axon distal to the cell body, okay? And we'll go all, it will involve degeneration of the entire axon. Usually the first thing that starts to show signs of degeneration actually is the terminals, okay? But then the entire axon will degenerate. It will fragment, change its chemical properties, and eventually it will disappear by processes of phagocytosis. Now the myelin stains will stain only the degenerating myelin, so it won't reach all these terminals. You also have degeneration in the opposite direction. Now the breakup of the axon is much slower, and in some cases doesn't even occur. There are then changes in the cell body, and usually when we talk about retrograde degeneration, we mean changes in the cell body. You'll get chromatolysis. The chromatin in the cell will change its distribution, so the cells will start looking different. In some cases, the cell will gradually degenerate. In other cases, it will just atrophy, but not, won't die, okay? We still call it retrograde degeneration. Sometimes we call it retrograde atrophy if the cell doesn't die. Okay, but there are then changes throughout the cell, taking various amounts of time. Here you have the anterograde degeneration pictured, and they're also pointing out that sometimes at the site of where the cell was cut, rather than dying the cell, the initial response is actually an attempt to regenerate. Okay? That occurs apparently in every cell, but cells vary a lot in how much they can regenerate. Okay? Most of them in the CNS, the majority of them will not be able to regrow their axon. Many of them will show some sprouting in the region of the cut. Okay, and we'll talk about that later on. Nauda, who was an MIT professor uh, for the last part of his career, before he came to MIT, was realizing the problems with the Markey method that you could never be sure of tracing tracks to their real site of termination. He investigated various silver staining methods because they could stain rather thin axons very well, and just normal axons. One of them was a method developed by Bilshowski. He liked it particularly well. Uh, he studied its chemistry and began to work with a man in Switzerland on modifying the Bilshowski stain so it would stain the degeneration better. They initially came up with a stain we now call the original out of stain, which did stain degeneration very well, but it stained all the normal axons pretty well too, so it was still pretty difficult to pick out the degenerating ones. His work with Gygax in Switzerland, sorry, this was the original out of stain, I think was before Gygax, okay? But then with Gygax, he worked on a method for suppressing the staining of the normal axons. And this was a huge breakthrough in track tracing techniques. Because so when you got that technique to work well, you could do the stain and all the normal axons would stain very lightly and the degenerating ones would keep staining darkly. Now the way he did that was they applied an oxidizing agent. Uh, the normal tissue would oxidize faster than the degenerating tissue, okay? So the length of time they exposed it to the oxidizing agent was very critical, and they often did trials using various periods of time in the oxidizing agent uh, to see when they could get the optimal stain. That stain did not, he wasn't convinced it always would stain the actual terminals very well, so he kept working on it. But it was only when he came to MIT, okay, that he was able with uh, Robert Fink, uh, working as a technician in his laboratory, he, de he developed a stain that would be specific 
for the accident all the way to the terminals. And Leonard Hamer, a Swedish neuroanatomist who had just come to work with Nauta, had also been working on these stains. He had a slightly different way of doing a similar thing. His method, Hamer's method, worked better for hypothalamus, limbic structures. Fink's method worked better for sensory pathways, motor pathways. So they, were, they published it together. And that became the standard method for track tracing for a number of years. Question. OK, what's the advantage of staining degenerating accents? It was a method of marking one particular tract. That's a critical question. OK, so now think of the experiment you could do. OK, we can, we can take out an eye destroy all the axons coming from the retina. They all start degenerating. Okay, we let the animal survive for a few days. So we get degeneration, but the axons have not disappeared yet. Now we apply one of these stains. Let's say we were applying uh, using the Fink Hamer method. We would stain the brain and we would see standing out in dark black the axon pathway. They would look like they're degenerating. It would be fragmented. Okay. And we'd learn to recognize the degenerating axon. But they, would very, they were very easy to see because now we have a stain that's specific for the degenerating axons. You could do other things. You could go into the brain with a little electrode and electrocute a few cells in one little region. Okay. And then you would tr trace the degeneration from that area. There's always problems with the degeneration techniques because when you're making a lesion in the brain, you're also killing the axons going through, unless you have some chemical method that will only kill cells and not axons. And there are such methods. But by the time those methods were developed, things that could kill cells and not fibers, other methods were beginning to be developed, methods using the intracellular transport properties of cells. Okay? So for example, it was found that the enzyme horseradish peroxidase, or HRP, as I mentioned before, if you put in the region of the terminals, will be taken up by the terminals of axons and transported back to the cell body. Here you see a cell here and cell here, all, everything in dark black there, cells in the retina, retinal ganglion cells that have transported HRP from a terminal area in the brain. Now in this particular case, another label has also been put in another part of the brain, nuclear yellow. It's a fluorescent molecule which is also taken up by axon endings and it gets transported retrogradely. Nuclear yellow binds primarily to the nucleus. And here you see a double labeled cell. So the two areas that were injected both contain axons from this one cell. And that's the advantage of a double retrograde staining technique. You can find out, get experimental knowledge about axon branching patterns. Here we have nuclear yellow in the nucleus and HRP in the cytoplasm. Here's another retrograde tracer, fluoro gold. Some of these tracing substances are rather expensive. <laughs> it is gold. Okay. But it marks cells very beautifully, more than nuclear yellow or HRP, uh, a little more like HRP, but even better, you can see it's got the entire cell body plus uh, axons and at least proximal dendrites. These are again in the retina. And you see this, the marking is varying in intensity, and that's because the brighter cells, we injected more of the terminals, they took up more of the substance than others. Now, in this case, in two different terminal regions of the retina, uh, we injected some in one place we put fluorescent beads. In another area we put the fluoro gold. <coughs> 
Okay, and then we can, because the molecules fluoresce at a different wavelength, okay, we use different filters in our microscope. We can see the fluorescent beads with one filter and the fluorogold gold with another. And we see here a cell in the middle that's got both labels. Other cells that have only one as these, especially the area injected with fluorogold. gold. Okay. So then we know that at least some of these cells, and we can chart their size and so forth and their locations, have axons going to both structures. Others have an axon going only to one of the two structures. Now, horseradish peroxidase is frequently used because it not only goes in the retrograde direction, it was discovered later, it's also a pretty good anterograde tracing technique. It will go from the cell bodies to the axon. That was discovered when the methods for visualizing HRP became more sensitive. And here, this is from work in my lab, we, we put HRP in an eye and we're looking at the optic tract here in the tween brain and you see the axon uh, arborizing in two structures, the ventral and dorsolateral geniculate bodies, a little bit here also, and you see them actually going right into the ventral basal nucleus, which you know, in the adult wouldn't do this, but in the baby, uh, they're a little more widespread in their connections, and that's what we were studying here. Okay. All of these methods that I've used, I find vary a lot in their sensitivity. The degeneration methods were pretty good, but they were very good for some structures. Other structures, it was difficult to see for sure whether there was any, really any accents, particularly areas of very sparse projection. That was also true of HRP, although HRP was more sensitive. And I didn't mention another method that was used around the time of HRP also very commonly and had one big advantage. It avoided that axon of passage problem. And that was radioactive tagging of proteins, of, I'm sorry, amino acids. So they would be taken up by cell bodies and synthesized into proteins and the proteins would be transported down the axons. So why did that avoid the fiber passage problem? Well, if you inject the amino acids into a structure in the brain, it's taken up by the cell bodies. It's also taken up by axons going through, uh, particularly at nodes or on VA, you will get some, but it doesn't get synthesized. No proteins are made except in the cell body. Okay, so it avoided the fiber passage problem, and that was tested experimentally. You could prove that it didn't label axons of passage. It only labeled the cells in the region of your injection site. But then how do we find the radioactivity? We can tag with tritium. Say we could use tritiated proline or tritiated leucine. These were the common ones. Okay. And then what do we do? Well, we have to wait a little while and leave the animal alive so the amino acids are taken into the cells, made into proteins, and then we have to have time for transport. But say you wait a few days, five days maybe, uh, and then we had to use a procedure called autoradiography where you section the brain, put them on the slides, put the sections on slides, then you go into a dark room, and in the dark you coat the slides with photographic emulsion and leave them in the dark for a long time. The radioactivity exposes the photographic emulsion. We would usually counter stain those sections for, us, for cell bodies with a missile stain usually so we could see the cell bodies and then we would see the silver grains in the photographic emulsion over the tissue so we could localize where, where those proteins went that had been transported from, from the cells we injected. Now that method had one other advantage that some of 
molecules like proline, if you leave them in, put a lot in and leave them long enough, they would actually cross the synapse and you would get transneuronal transport. Okay. And so we could, we could map out the termination pattern in the visual cortex from injecting the eye, even though there was a synapse in the thalamus. Okay. So there are a number of advantages to these techniques. Later it was found that HRP will actually go transferonally too. I still found that the sensitivity was a problem. The most sensitive method I found uses another method called immunohistochemical staining or marking. Okay, well, we're using an antibody for the molecule we've put in. The one I like the best for tracing in the visual system is a fragment of the cholera toxin molecule. We often use pretty dangerous stuff in the lab. Uh, we don't get the full cholera toxin, so we're pretty safe. Uh, we use a subunit of it. Uh, this fragment of cholera toxin is taken up, and when we use immunohistochemistry to find that molecule, we use an antibody against cholera toxin. I find that it's extremely sensitive. I've been able here. I'm showing you a bright field picture uh, where we've bound the antibody, the secondary antibody that we could could mark with HRP. Um, if we look at it in dark field, you can see it here in part of the geniculate body. This was so sensitive because it could stain the entire axon right to the terminals, not just the terminals. It didn't stain them in a fragmented way, so they looked like Golgi pictures. And I was able to show that the retina, uh, with the students I was working with, the retina projects to many different structures at the base of the brain, hypothalamic areas that were not originally believed to be part of the projection area of the retina. We still don't know what some of those projections do. Now, immunofluorescence can be used to mark several things at the same time. In this case, you see a, a cell's dendrite, and you see two different markers, one that's marking the inside of the dendrite, and another that seems to be marking something on the surface. I think they were using a synaptic, uh, a protein specific to synaptic regions. And you can see that if you look at higher magnification, where they're also marking the nuclei of cells with a third antibody. Okay. In each case, they're linking the antibody to a fluorescent marker. Okay. And for that, you need a secondary antibody. And these procedures have been well worked out, and they're the most common methods now for getting sensitive marking. And of course, that last method, immunohistochemistry, can be used for more than just axon tracing. You can find, as I showed you in the last picture, you can use it to find a specific location of various molecules in the brain. Okay. So let's talk now a little bit about specializations of the membrane, if we have time, a little bit about endogenous activity. Um, this is a different order in your, than, than your printout, but they're the same topics. I put them in a different order because we've already talked about the axonal uniqueness, the uniqueness of the axonal membrane with its voltage-gated ion channels, particularly for sodium that cause, uh, result in the axon potential. This is a very, this is a specialization for irritability. Postsynaptic membrane receptors are another example of a specialization. We haven't talked yet about transduction mechanisms, sensory transduction, that result in receptor potentials if they're specialized receptor cells, generator potentials in the uh, dendritic part of the neuron. And I've given you this picture because it's a nice classification of major receptor types in organisms. These are not the only types, okay? For example, we have chemoreceptors that can detect oxygen, for example, in the blood. We don't think about those very much because we don't sense oxygen, but as part of our autonomic nervous system, we 
you think more, though, about taste and smell, where you have specialized receptor cells and taste buds in the tongue. And these are connected to primary sensory axon terminals, actually the dendritic part of the primary sensory neurons. The receptor potential is generated in these receptor cells in response to particular chemicals that we in our mouths. Okay, and that causes changes in the properties of the membrane here and leads to action potentials beginning here at the axon hillock and then going into the central nervous system. In the case of smell, it's a little bit different, where in the olfactory epithelium lining our nasal cavities, the neurons themselves act as the receptors. Okay, the dendritic portion of the primary sensory neuron is embedded in the mucosa of the, the nasal mucosa, and molecules that we take in through the air dissolve in that mucosa and specifically stimulate particular receptors in uh, the primary sensory neuron, which then generates action potentials which reach then into the central nervous system, the olfactory bulb, cranial nerve one. Then we have various mechanoreceptors, receptors that are specialized for detecting mechanical stretching and poking, okay, or vibration. This is a axon ending dendritic part of a cell in the skin with a little specialized structure around it. The Pacinian corpuscle is good for detecting fine uh, pressure changes. We also have free nerve endings in the skin that respond to deformation of the skin. Uh, we have endings, sensory endings in muscle that detect muscle stretch. There are others in joints that detect tension in our joints. These are all examples of mechanoreceptor, and another one is in the ear, okay? Where there are specialized cells in a membrane, the basilar membrane in the ear, which when the basilar membrane vibrates, the vibration is detected by these sensory neurons, uh, the sensory cells rather, they're not neurons, the specialized sensory cells, which then cause a receptor potential that affects the primary sensory neuron endings in the cochlea. And finally, we have, in the visual system, we have the ability to detect photons, okay, which is a different kind of thing. And we can show you, this is uh, a characterization of what kind of thing is happening with chemoreception, mechanoreceptor, receptors and photoreception. In the case of photoreception, which I didn't finish previously, you have a specialized membrane inside the cell that responds to photons and results in a, a molec mo molecular release that affects a membrane receptor, which then in turn affects the, the ion channel. All it does is change the amount of current flowing through the membrane. It doesn't cause any action potentials, okay. In our retina, the primary, the rods and cones, the receptor cells change in their membrane potentials in response to photons, but they don't actually generate action potentials, and that's true also for other cells in the retina. It's true for some cells in the olfactory bulb. In the case of mechanoreceptors, it, it, in response to deformation, stretching, or movement of some sort of the membrane. You can hear they simply show an ion channel being stretched open. It's probably not what actually happens. They're probably the, the mechanical change in the membrane results in changes in, in, the, in proteins. Um, and then when these proteins change their conformation, you get ion flow across the membrane. In the case of chemoreceptors, usually it appears to be like the the metabotropic receptors we talked about before, the binding is to a specific molecule which then in turn affects a nearby receptor, 
I want to say a little bit more about endogenous activity, but I'll have to do that at the beginning of the next hour.